Top 10 catchers in Major League Baseball for 2023. Welcome to the Gist Baseball Show. That's Arm Layton and I'm Peter Apple. And it is Friday, February 24th. Normally we have Jack on the Friday episodes, all three of us. Not today. He's traveling, probably stuffing his face with Culver's or something stupid like that. Arm and I are back. This Culver's thing has really taken a bite of its, it's own. Take, I, dude, I would have <laughs> never thought. I would have never thought. You know, it's actually, I'm glad you brought this up. There, there's there's few moments like we, we've had some awesome guests on the podcast and like there's those moments where you realize like oh wow people are actually listening this, this it hasn't come up in a while this culver's thing was one of the first times where i'm like shit man people are listening to us because like i didn't i couldn't believe how many like texts like dms tweets whatever about a burger place i've never heard of um and and a, i guess an ignorant take from us but no, um, not that, was just a, that was a, a great reminder of just like people are listening. Um, and it's a good thing that we mostly talk about baseball because we stray from baseball a little bit and then boom. Um, but we did find. So for those who don't know, Jack and Peter are coming down to visit me in my old stomping grounds uh, where my mom still lives. We're covering the World Baseball Classic and spring training in March. And Peter identified a Culver's within 20 minutes of my house. We will be going there and we will be providing a review. Um, so I am definitely looking forward to probably being disappointed by a fast food burger, but you know, people take a lot of pride in that kind of stuff. And I promise I will not fake it. If I like it better than in and out, you will hear me say that you, you most actually, likely you'll be I'm going into it. Not, not thinking it's going to be your, that close. I have a question. Brand? I have a question for you. It's 20 minutes from your house. Why haven't you gone? It's the best burger in the country. According to Jack. <laughs> It. I've never go. heard of it, but um, they need to market better. Maybe we'll, we'll find out. We'll find out. I didn't know there was one in Florida. I do want to shout out our uh, Midwest listeners. I hear you. I love you. And I we're going to talk about some Reds. We're going to talk about some Pirates, Cubs, uh, Whites. Everything we're going to talk about your favorite baseball team. But it's not personal. I mean, we're not coming after you. We'll try it, and if we like it, we'll tell you. If we don't, yeah. we're still going to make fun of you because this yeah. is the just baseball show. And unfortunately, sometimes we talk a little bit more about baseball. But how about let's talk baseball let's yeah. get into it let's top 10 catchers of course we have our honorable mentions we have come out with our second base rankings shortstop rankings and double play combination rankings all on just baseball.com all in earlier episodes of this week honorable mention first one gabriel moreno the new arizona diamondback now in his First little stint, he showed flashes of that hit tool that had him ranked as one of the best overall prospects in baseball. Yeah. Similar to guys like Francisco Alvarez, similar to some of the best catching prospects in baseball. He's up there with anybody. And he was included in that trade for Dalton Varsho and now figures to slot in as the starting catcher for the Arizona Diamondbacks because Carson Kelly just hasn't impacted the baseball in a couple of years. And I think the Diamondbacks know that he's more well-suited for a backup role at this point. I think both of us are very excited to see him do it, but he's got to do it. Yeah. And that's the bottom line, right? Yeah. I think the fact, I mean, the catching position has quickly become stronger. You know, it was really thin a couple of years ago and now we've seen, you know, a lot of players take a leap, like a guy will get to at number 10 or, you know, some young prospects like Adley Rutschman, who that's not a spoiler that he's obviously near the top of this list, like coming up and, and just immediately succeeding. So with Moreno, you know, I think maybe two years ago, he might have somehow still pushed his way into the top 10. But, you know, with some of the talent now, he's just on the outside. I will say this is one of the guys that I, I don't know if he's going to hit a ceiling, which is one of the best catchers in baseball. But I feel so confident that he's going to be at least a good catcher. Like this is a 90% zone contact guy. This is a guy that's a good, a good defender, good athlete. And the power has never quite come through totally yet, but he shows flashes of it. Like he had 113 mile an hour double that got stuck in a wall last year. Literally put a hole in a wall. So like, this is a dude that has the tools to be one of the best catchers in the game. Um, and what he's already done in the minors, I think is more than enough to give him an honorable mention. Yeah, I mean, he came up last year and hit 319, but it was only in 69 at-bats, had one home run, and he's still just 23 years old. He has a really strong arm behind the dish, and I think he's a pretty solid defensive catcher, and we know he's going to hit. He'll probably be on top 10 catchers list for a very long time. That's why we had to mention him in the honorable mentions, even though he doesn't have the track record to back it up. This is more of us having a lot of confidence in the young 23-year-old, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, no doubt about it. I'm I, I would put a lot of money on him being in the top ten by by next year. His former teammate also makes the honorable mentions list, and I know Blue Jays fans are gonna be upset because they think 
Danny Jansen is a top five catcher. Um, and we were talking pre-record like he played 72 games last year, put up a 140 WRC plus, which led all catchers with a minimum of 200 plate appearances and put up 2.6 F4. But again, just 72 games. Yeah. I think that Blue Jays fans and a lot of people have to understand this is something that we were talking about. It's much easier to be completely fresh. And to only play 72 games every year or 70 games or 80 games. The role of a starting catcher where you have to play 120 games, that's a really hard job on your knees, on your entire body. So he has the luxury of being fresher than a lot of the starters because, of course, he's backing up Alejandro Kirk, which we will find on our top 10 catchers list. Danny Jansen is a really good catcher. Even though he's a backup, he still makes this list. That's how much we like him. But that has to be said. He cannot be a top 10 catcher as a backup. Yeah. I think that's just the bottom line. Yeah, and like there's a legit chance that, you know, maybe Danny Jansen, if you put him on another team um, and he plays 150 games, maybe you extrapolate the numbers and he's exactly as good as he was last year. But there's no way to fully know that. Um, and you know, when you don't have a sample size of a full season, it like you said, it's kind of hard to to put this guy ahead of some of the other dudes who are, you know, grinding back there defensively, producing a little bit on the offensive side. I would love to see Jansen get everyday reps, though, to answer this very question. Uh, obviously, 15 home runs in 72 games is ridiculous. The defense is good, too. Um, so there's a legit chance that he could be a top 7-8 catcher in the game if he plays every day. But we got to see this dude go through the wear and tear that comes with the catching position and be back there and and do it for a whole year uh, to be in this list. But that said, he is by far the best backup catcher in baseball and probably talented enough to be a top 10 guy. But yeah, you got to play more than 72 games. And I also found it interesting too, that the Blue Jays were willing to part with Gabriel Moreno because they knew they obviously had Alejandro Kirk, but they do have the best backup catcher in baseball in Danny Jansen. And like you said, if he moves to another team is a starting catcher, and even gives us 80% of these numbers, he's a top 10 guy, but he just has it. So what are we supposed to do? We have to rank him in the honorable mentions because we understand the talent, but at the end of the day, he's backed. He's a backup. So next one, and I'm really excited for this guy. And I think I fought to put him on our top 10, but the problem is just not a large sample size. And the defense is what can kill him because, of course, he's going to play some DH, but he should play catcher most of the season for the Milwaukee Brewers. And that is William Contreras, obviously brother of Wilson Contreras, and he hits like his brother. He hit 20 home runs in 97 games, um, but he's got to improve on the framing. Uh, but that's a skill that the Brewers teach really, really well, right? We saw with Omar Nervaez, they're very good at helping catchers through that. So the bat is there. It's just not a large sample size. And we don't exactly know how well he's going to perform defensively over an entire season as a starter. That's yeah. why I understand keeping him off. But I think this guy has crazy juice, some of the most juice of any catcher in Major League Baseball. Yeah, I, I'm I'm definitely worried about the defense. Offensively, I, I think he's going to go nuclear. We we talked about, you know, some of the more underrated moves this offseason, I think, getting Billy Bombs, which is one of my favorite nicknames for, for a player. And uh, Dylan Short uh, actually clued me into that one, does a great job on the Braves beat. I know he was upset uh, about Contreras being traded, but you know, hard to feel bad for him when when the team he covers gets Sean Murphy. But back to the, the point here is that it, it is all about the bat with Contreras. And, you know, if he can be – passable defensively that bat in Milwaukee he's he's gonna hit 30 30 home runs potentially hit 20 and 92 games last year but similar to what we said about Danny Jansen we got to apply it to Contreras here right can he catch every single day and and will that impact his offense and if he catches every day how much of a liability would he be defensively because he only threw out 16 percent of base dealers if I'm not mistaken um he did commit a decent amount of errors for a guy that didn't completely play all the time behind the dish so if he can improve behind the dish he is a guy that could very easily become a, another candidate to be in the top 10 here but regardless that bat's gonna play uh, no matter where you stick him in the field before we get into our top 10 this is just something that I'm curious about. And as the prospect guy, I can't think of anybody better to ask. And I know Mets fans are curious about this guy, too. Francisco Alvarez, do we think he's 
going to play this year? Because everything I've heard is most likely no. They have Omar Nervaez. They have Thomas Nito. And I, I've i heard from Mets people that they don't want to diminish his value by playing him in a full season of DH because they value his defense and they want him to continue working on that in the minor leagues. Yeah. But at the same time, they have a need for power and they could use a DH. So that's why I think this is a fascinating question because there's lanes for other top prospects. Grayson Rodriguez with the Orioles, he's going to pitch. We even probably think Andrew Painter, even though he's super young, is going to pitch for the Phillies. Yeah. But for like, oh, like, is Alvarez going to contribute? Is he going to contribute? Is he going to get a tribute? And like, yeah, he probably will. But why rush it? So I think that's the perfect number is 80 because a half season to work on the defensive side of things. But also he's got some holes, you know, in his game offensively right now. He cannot lay off the high fastball. He was chasing him a ton. Uh, he was swinging and missing a little bit more than you'd like to see the end zone whiff a little bit higher. So there's some small little tweaks that he needs to make that in 80 games in triple A, I think they could bring him up and he could be the perfect complement as that like half time, half DH, half catcher, splitting time, roaming around and being a power bat for them. But yeah, I love the idea of 80 games and triple A to just kind of work through those things, 70 games, and then back half of the season. I do think he can make an impact for the Mets. Perfect. Let's get into the top 10 catchers. At number 10, Jonah Heim of the Texas Rangers put up 2.8 F4 last season, slash 227, 298, 399 in 450 plate appearances. Got you for 16 bombs, walked at a decent amount, 9.1%, struck out less than 20%, was around a league average hitter by WRC+, plus, recording a 99, and his defensive metrics. That's his calling card. So that's what I think gets him onto this top 10. We were all waiting for Jonah Heim to put up that at least average season because catchers, it's much more about the glove. And then if you're an average hitter, you're going to get a lot of love at this position. And that's exactly what Jonah Heim did. While the glove is great, it's only been one season truly of a great bat, but eight defensive runs saved, 9.1 in the framing metrics. Jonah Heim has consistently had a great glove, but this is finally the year he put up the average offensive season, and I like that he doesn't strike out. I like that he takes his walks. That's what puts him at number 10 for us. Yeah, I'm always surprised he didn't put up a little bit more of of an F4. Um, you know, I wonder where like metrically he kind of got docked, but you know, obviously the defense still put him up to to two point what was it two point eight? Two point eight. The fact that he was a ninety nine WRC plus guy, but if you're going to be a league average hitter as a phenomenal defensive catcher, that's a top ten catcher, right? Like that's exactly what that is. But Danny Jansen, if he played 120, 130 games. I think probably pushes past Jonah Heim, but Jonah Heim was really good in the first half and then struggled in the second half a little bit. So he he maybe ran out of gas. This was his first season playing over a hundred games uh, in terms of at the big league level and 127 games intense behind the dish at the big league level. He faded a bit at the end of the year. So, you know, what's interesting is it's something that you got to give him the benefit of the doubt on because, you know, is, are we going to penalize him for playing more games? No, I think we should reward him. So he was phenomenal. I think it was a 116 WRC plus in the first half, faded in the second half, but the defense, you know, as Ryan Ficklestein mentioned this on, on who's better the other day, we were talking about shortstops, gloves don't slump. And Jonah Himes' glove didn't slump, and he was consistently a great catcher for them. I think the bat could be even better next year, too. If he didn't fall off so hard in the second half, he probably would have been above average offensively. So um, Heim is really fun to watch do his thing behind the dish, and I think is a really safe bet to just be a solid catcher every single year moving forward. I totally agree. And the best defender at the position last year comes in at number nine, and that's Jose Trevino of the New York Yankees, who put up a 3.7 F war in 353 plate appearances, slash 248, 283, 388, with 11 bombs, didn't really walk much, but also didn't really strike out much, was a below average hitter, 91 WRC plus, but again, the calling card was the defense and by the numbers and honestly watching him every day, he was the best defender I've ever watched consistently at the position. And I don't say that lightly from the 20 to 25 years. I'm 25 years old watching Yankee baseball. This was as good of a glove as I've ever seen. 21 defensive runs saved 19.1 in the framing metrics. Aram, 
I also think it's important to say because, for example, Jonah Heim, 99 WRC+. plus. Jose Trevino, 91 WRC+. plus. That's compared to the entire league. That's not compared to catchers. Because yeah. the catching position, the average WRC plus for a catcher, I think, is around 92. So Jonah Heim, at least for catchers, is an above average hitter, while Jose Trevino, compared to other catchers, is around average, which I also think is important to note here. Because again, this is a demanding position where it's hard to hit consistently, especially in the second half. And it's pr- been proven with at least these first two guys because Trevino came out hot, made the all-star team, but then had a slower second half with the bat. Yeah, so here's the here's the slash line for catchers in the league, uh, which is a very important point. And it swings back the other way. I always try to make this point with, like, first baseman, too. Like, oh, yeah, that first baseman has a 105 WRC+, plus, but, like, the average first baseman is probably a little bit better than that. So it's it's slightly below average. It's got you got to compare positions here, especially catcher. Average catcher, 226, 295, 367 slash line last year. That's at 89 WRC plus. So it's even worse than I thought. Even worse. That's even worse than I would have thought. I would have said 91, 92, maybe. Um, so like that just just kind of puts into perspective how how weak offensively the the catching position is. So Torino actually slightly above average and um, you talk about the defense, man. I mean, that that guy is as good as it gets. What's amazing, too, is is how well the Yankees made out on that trade. I want to, like, highlight that. Albert Abreu and Robbie Alstrom was was the package that they sent out. And Abreu was pitching for the Yankees again, wasn't he, by the end of the year? Yes, so, he was. Like, Not very good, but he was pitching for the Yankees. But he, but the point is, is he wasn't a Royal anymore. Or, that's or, the point. Or a Ranger, excuse me, anymore. Um, so, you know, I think that's, that's pretty nuts. Um, and... <laughs> A great trade there by the Yanks, but yeah, I, w- I want to see how Trevino's bat ticks up because I really do think the guy can swing it. Like I do think he's he's at least an average hitter. So uh, regardless, his defense is going to keep him right around this back end of the top ten. Yeah, as Yankee fans, I remember um, at the end of last season, you know, everyone thought he was a hole offensively, and he was a hole offensively. But I, I kept clamoring and telling them. The glove is so impactful. Like even if he goes up, it goes over four every game. It doesn't matter. Well, the slump. glove was the glove. Don't slump and. One thing is, too, and something I wanted to highlight, like framing metrics are tough. Um, yeah. Catching statistics defensively are very challenging. They're not perfect. But it was the one time where I was watching the numbers go up in real time. Mm-hmm. Like the the amount of strikes that Trevino would steal on a game-by-game game basis was incredible. And we spoke with Ryan LaVarnway on the Just Baseball show, who's a... He's been playing in Major League Baseball and Minor League Baseball for 12-plus years. And he was saying that front offices that he spoke to, three strikes stolen by a catcher is the same as an RBI for a hitter. It's that impactful. It can save a run, basically, if you steal three strikes in a game. I'm so glad you brought that up. So I was just talking to one of my buddies in the Angels org, Anthony Mulrine, who's like defensive catcher, like through and through. Uh, and and. He- I was asking him just like, you know, with, with the stances that they try to get them in, like the one leg kicked out the splits that that catchers will get into. Uh, I'm like, it's kind of hard to throw guys out like that. If you're doing that with guys on base, cause I noticed he was doing it with guys on base. And he said, they tell us that they'd rather have a strike than 90 feet. So like legitimately they'd rather him steal a strike and have the guy steal second base. Like they'd rather that, which is pretty wild. That was the first one where I was like, Whoa, really? You give them 90 feet, and obviously it depends on you – know, it can be circumstantial, but there's a lot of scenarios where they prefer the strike than the 90 feet, especially with two outs, which is absolutely nuts. So uh, that shows you the importance of framing. It's a part of the reason why I don't totally want the complete automated strike zone. I want the challenge system, um, but I don't want the complete automation because, like, it's an art, man, and, and it's a really valuable art that a lot of these guys spend a lot of time doing, and that's why we put it into these rankings because all of these dudes practice it. Some more than others, and some are better than others. I just saw a clip of JT Real Muto working on framing the other day. That guy doesn't need to work on anything. Uh, and, like, he's grinding his framing. Like, it's an important thing still. And compared to other catchers, Jose Trevino, 91 WRC+. plus. The average is 89, so he's slightly above other catchers, but still finished fifth among catchers in F4. That's how good he yep. was defensively. But at number eight is a player that I know you really like. I really like, I know Jack really likes him. And maybe that influenced us putting him a number eight because he's had trouble staying on the field. And that is Tyler Stevenson 
with the Cincinnati Reds at number eight, who put up a one and a half F4 season, but in 183 plate appearances, hit 319, 372, 482 slugging percentage, walked a decent amount, didn't strike out a crazy amount, and had a 134 WRC plus and was a slightly below average defender. He only played 50 games, but those 50 games were all-star level caliber, and he's still just 26 years old. So we've seen him do it before in prior seasons, like 2021, he was a really good catcher. He was on our honorable mentions list, deserved to be among the better catchers, and then just got hurt, only played 50 games. But it's not a Danny Jansen to Tyler Stevenson. It's Tyler Stevenson got hurt, Danny Jansen was healthy, but was fresher and put in spots to succeed the entire season. Tyler Stevenson, I think if he plays a full 162, is even better than the number eight spot on our list. Yeah, this is one that's going to make us look good or bad. Yep. Uh, um, You know, I guess they all can make us look good or bad, but this is one that I feel like could really make us look good or bad because this is somebody that I'm willing to roll the dice on. I think the Reds actually came out and said, they're planning to move him around a little bit more to kind of, you know, keep him healthy, uh, which is which is a good sign. So, you know, maybe he's not going to catch as much, but we'll see. You know, usually there's smoke sometimes and things shake out a different way. But offensively, I mean, this guy's a this guy rakes. You talked about what he did in 50 games. How about, you know, what, what we saw from him even in 132 games in 2021? Like it was really, really solid then, too. Um, and it looked like he was building off of that and off to an even better start. He had 10 home runs in 132 games in 2021. Already had six home runs through 50 games, you know, this past season before going down. So, and this has been through being banged up, getting back on the field and getting banged up again. Obviously, if he has another year where he's hurt, uh, I think you have to start baking that into your assessment of Tyler Stevenson. But I think he earned, he's earned himself one more year to kind of see how things go and, you know, see how he's able to potentially stay healthy and, and hopefully be able to you know, prove how of, of how good he can be. This is a big X factor for the Reds too, you know, because I think the Reds, obviously they're not competing next year, but they've got talent. We're starting to see a lot of that talent make its way up to the big league level. And if India bounces back, if Stevenson plays to his capability, this is a sneaky good team that, you know, you're not just showing up to Cincinnati and expecting to just walk all over them like, you know, some of the other bottom feeders, quote unquote, in this league. Number seven, Cal Raleigh of the Seattle Mariners put up a 4.2 F4 season last year. Not going to be very high in the batting average department through 415 plate appearances last year, but his game is power as well as defense. 211 batting average, but a 284 OBP, 489 slugging percentage with 27 home runs. Yes, he does strike out 29% of the time, but he walks 9.2% of the time to give him a 121 WRC plus. And again, the defensive metrics are beautiful. 14 defensive runs saved 8.2 framing uh, on the framing metrics. He's just a power machine. Who's great defensively kind of similar to Mike Zunino in that way. But I think Mike Zunino, remember that season where he crushed, it seemed like a home run every day and played good defense. And that was kind of his game. It's kind of similar here, but I believe in Cal Raleigh's bat more than I did at the time. Mike Zunino. I remember we were doing the ring. I was like, that was a shot in the dark. Cal Raleigh. This seems like prolonged success. Like this will continue to happen. Maybe he doesn't hit 27, but he probably will hit 20 to 25. He's still going to be really good defensively. He's still young. He's incredibly important for the Mariners young pitching staff because he is a great glove behind the plate Cal Raleigh at seven I think Mariners fans might be upset I think some other fans might be saying how is he this high if you watch Mariners baseball consistently I think the only thing that we might have done wrong is ranking him too low honestly I was gonna say this is a guy that I think could very easily be in the top five by the end of the year um yeah he's 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 gonna hit 220 230 every year maybe maybe even lower than that But I think the power is, like, that good. Like, I really do think he's going to hit 25 to 30 home runs every single year. I mean, this is a dude that was routinely popping 110-mile-per-hour exit velocities. And uh, he's a switch hitter, too. And and it's pretty even from both sides. So, you know, at least if you're going to be a swing and miss guy, if you're a switch hitter, you, you know, at least you don't have to worry about him getting, like, diced up by lefties to a 130 batting average. Or, like, for Mike Zanino, he he eats more against lefties, and then righties, like, really gave him fits. 
Uh, he's always going to hit more, I think, than Zanino. The power is right there with him, and the defense is fantastic. He was also playing with a jacked-up thumb last year. So I do wonder, like, getting healthy, um, you know, he was playing through that jacked-up thumb, and as a switch hitter, like, maybe one of his sides it was bothering him more than the other. Um, I, the defense isn't going to isn't gonna really change. It's going to be really good. I think the bat's only going to get better and better. Rally, I, I would probably say, if we're predicting, I'm curious where you stand on this, Pete, I would say that, I think Riley's going to be a top five catcher by the end of the year. Obviously he'd have to bump somebody out. And I, I honestly think he will. I think it's very possible. I have a friend who is a diehard Seattle Mariners fan. And uh, I was texting with him about our top 10 catchers list um, because I knew he'd be upset about Raleigh's ranking, even though we thought that we ranked him pretty high. And he said, Raleigh ended the drought. He's better than real Muto. And I just thought that was hilarious, but like, he is also a very clutch player too. Like he hit the home run to end the the drought, which led to the greatest call from the Seattle booth too. Like, this is a guy who I agree with you. I think could bump into the top five, but our top six is so freaking loaded and they've done it year after year after year, except for our number six guy who just has incredible talent and is coming off an all-star um, game of himself, and that's Alejandro Kirk coming in at number six, who put up a 3.8 F4 last season in 541 plate appearances. This guy hit 285 batting average, 372 on base percentage, and a 415 slug, 14 home runs, but he walked more than he struck out, put up a higher WRC plus than Cal Raleigh did and was almost as good defensively. The only hole in Alejandro Kirk's game is the arm because he's going to hit. He's going to hit for a decent amount of power compared to the rest of the position. His plate discipline, I think, is the best on this list, maybe outside of a rookie who we're going to get to later, but at least by the numbers, the walk to strike out, like it doesn't get better than that. Alejandro Kirk was always a guy with great batted ball data who some scouts looked at and saw a five foot eight, 250 pound bowling ball and thought, no way he's going to be good. But I got to give credit to our guy Colby Olson on this one because we rip on Colby for some of his takes. He's been an Alejandro Kirk guy like before anyone I knew was an Alejandro Kirk guy. And now he's really developing as one of the best catchers in baseball. And I fully believe like that's why it's hard for me to say, yeah, Cal Raleigh will overtake a guy like Kirk because Kirk has all the ability to go even higher too. Like this, this is yeah. where the position gets really good. I think it's interesting too. Cause him and Kirk couldn't, you know, Riley and Kirk couldn't be more different. Right. Um, you know, we're talking about a swing and miss power guy though, though Kirk has some power, but a swing and miss power guy with, with really good defense to, uh, a guy that, you know, is is, is all right defensively, uh, I think has gotten a lot better there. But really bat to ball and, and approach is what makes Kirk what he is. I would say of the top 10, he's without a doubt the best bat to ball guy on this list. 90% zone contact is insane. And he was 89-90. I mean, that is ridiculous. He doesn't chase. Um, you mentioned walking more than he strikes out. Uh, it's one of the best swinging strike rates I've seen. Like, I, I know why Kobe like, liked him so much because it was the same story in the minors. It was, you know, just not a lot of swing and miss, not a lot of swinging strikes, ton of zone contact, just walking a lot. Like, it's this one of the safer offensive profiles you're going to find. And for him to not be a, a dreadful defender, beyond that, he actually was a pretty decent defender last year. Like, that puts him in a spot now to be a really good catcher for a long time. He was 23 last year, Peter. It doesn't feel like it doesn't look, he doesn't look like it. He looks a little bit older, uh, but he's 23. Uh, if the defense holds up, I think the bat's going to keep getting better. He's a guy who I think is going to be top five by the end of the year. I was trying to fight for him over the number five guy, but the number five guy has so much consistency through the years yeah. that it's just like, I think I know what I'm going to get for him year in and year out. And that matters like that, knowing that it brings me back to the same conversation we had last year, Freddie Freeman versus Vladdy. Yeah. Vladdy had a much better season, but it was his first year. And we knew what Freddie was going to do year in and year out. But before I get to a number five, Jeff McNeil had an 87.1% zone contact percentage, led Major League Baseball in batting average. What was Alejandro Kirk's zone percentage, zone contact percentage? 89% better than Jeff McNeil last year. Alejandro Kirk can hit, and he's going to keep hitting. And at least behind the plate, not throwing out runners, but behind the plate, 
very, very solid. But that brings us to number five, the new St. Louis Cardinal, Wilson Contreras, who put up a 3.3 F4 last year, 487 plate appearances, slash 243, 349, 466 slugging, 22 bombs, walked a lot, didn't strike out much, 132 WRC plus at the catching position, but he's a slightly below average defender. And that's been his issue his entire career. Not throwing out runners. He has one of the bazooka arms behind the plate of any catcher in baseball. And that sometimes goes unnoticed. While we both understand framing is more important, the arm still matters. And while the framing is slightly below average, minus three and a half in the framing metrics, that's below average, but it's not terrible the the message around him is that he's this terrible defensive catcher which i think is getting way overblown it's like again the narrative of someone it's like he's struggling a little bit defensively and then it gets taken to the extreme and now he's terrible he's not terrible and he's an automatic bat automatic 20 bombs he's gonna walk a lot and a 132 wrc plus last year wilson Contreras should be the fifth best catcher in baseball if you're not going to be a great blocker or, you know, re- receiver maybe, which I think he's shown flashes of being more than fine in those departments, but I think that's kind of where he got docked. Throw guys out. Slow the run game. Well, guess what, dude? He he threw out 46% of base stealers. Like, that is elite, elite, elite. Um, I, I, I do wonder if the defense will kind of tick back up going over to, you know, a place where he, I think he's a little reinvigorated. Obviously, there were some – I don't even know what was going on in Chicago with him. Obviously there was a lot of weird stuff with the way that they handled him and not extending him and, you know, whatever was happening there. But I I do believe it. And I've seen him talk about like how much pride he takes in being kind of like the heir apparent to to Yachty, like filling that role and filling those shoes. I do wonder how how he's going to defend and and if there's going to be a priority and a focus on improving that. Cause if he improves even a little bit defensively, he's one of the best hitting catchers in in the game and he's a middle of the order masher if he wasn't a catcher so um it was a tough one though kirk versus Contreras. but when you have the offensive season that he had last year um and and when you do what he has done for so long i think i think you're right peter like would it shock you i I think we both believe that kirk is going to take that step forward and continue to be great but if let's say kirk struggles out of the gate would that shock you like it's baseball sophomore slump for a catcher happens all the time uh Contreras I would be shocked if he did not hit well next year um like right out of the gate that would honestly shock me I totally agree and a guy like Contreras too I just think this is so important to talk about because consistency especially at this position not only consistency with the bat but also consistently staying on the field for a catcher to play a hundred games in every year, except for his rookie year. And then 2020, there was 60 games scheduled. He played 57. He played 113, 128, all of the 60 game season, 105, 138, 117. So he's going to stay on the field. He's going to hit, he's going to be a leader. He's going to almost eliminate the run game where bigger bases, Jack said it, it won't really matter. It won't impact more. Skills. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. Yeah. But Wilson Contreras is certainly going to do his job to limit that. Like that is so impactful. So Wilson had to be number five, even though I think both of us are thinking to ourselves, Kirk should take the step forward. It's, but, it could, it's probably going to flip flop by mid season, but you got to You got to pay have, homage to the, to the vets. Exactly. And he deserves it. And it's not like, he's this grizzled veteran who's over his prime and we're just handing him a ticket being like, you know what? You've done awesome in your career. Let's rank you at number five just to be nice. No, he's 30. He's not he's 30. 80. He could take a leap next year. He could, he could improve in some ways. You never know. But number four, this is where the list gets real good. Real good. Sean Murphy. Uh, Atlanta Braves. Love this man. 5.1 F4 last year. 612 plate appearances. Plays basically every day. 250, 332, 426 slash line, 18 bombs, doesn't strike out, takes his walks, 122 WRC+. plus. The defensive numbers were down last year, still above average, but down from, I guess, elite where they have been in previous years. One defensive run saved, 8.7 in the framing metrics. But I think Sean Murphy is as well-rounded of a catcher that we have in Major League Baseball. Gold Glove in 2021 in his real first full season, 
2022 finished 11th in the American League in F4, 10th place MVP vote. He's awesome. I love Sean Murphy. The Braves got a really good one. Really good one, man. And, and and honestly, I do wonder, like, defensively, how much of it was just the really crappy pitching staff and um, just just almost just getting exhausted of being out there in Oakland. Um, because, I mean, there's a lot of just, like, focus and, and uh, attentiveness and, and energy that goes into catching as well. And, and we've seen Murphy be a great defender. What what I'm interested on on the offensive side of things is and you, I know you're the splits guy, Peter. I got splits for you here. We, we know the Coliseum. We know Oakland is a brutal place to hit. Um, on the road, 129 WRC plus last year at home, 114. No slouch at home. But how about the, the the slash line? It really kind of encapsulates it. Home slash line, 227, 321, 386. Road slash line, 271, 343, 465. It's a 100 OPS difference. If if Sean Murphy is that away slash line next year, he's a top what catcher in baseball? Damn you. You took you took my notes. Damn it. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. He's going to be a beast. And I was talking <laughs> it like I was going to save that too for the Braves episode where we do at least previews and like why I think they're like the team to beat the National League. And I was going to go all over the splits. You did it for me, but I'm glad you did because it needed to be said. And it's not like I have ownership over splits. I'm glad you brought I mean, them you kind of because... do. Yeah, I guess <laughs> somewhat. But you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. this guy could be at his floor is one of the best defensive catchers in baseball who is an above-average hitter. What he could be is one of the best hitting catchers in baseball, which I think he will be, and the best defensive catcher in baseball. That good. He could like, be JT Real Muto-esque. Like, exactly. Really I really think so. Like, he's not the athlete. He's not the base stealer that Real Muto is. He's a but he's athlete. got kind of everything else, yeah. and I think he could be a better all-around hitter than JT Real Muto can. I really do, because some of these WRC Plus seasons, they've been above what JT has done in his entire career. And we're going to get to JT in a minute because he's a freak and he's awesome and he's yeah. well uh, high on our list. But I just think Sean Murphy is the guy, if you're looking at this catcher's list, who could be the guy to get to number one? He's one of the first names I immediately think. And I that think has four a, has a shot. Yeah. I think four I is a good spot he, for him, but yeah, go ahead. I, I would say I definitely think he can pass the guy ahead of him, but not yet. He's not there yet, but the guy that you're about to intro, I, I think by the end of the year, it's going to be interesting because this guy can make a leap too, yeah. but I'm just saying I wouldn't be surprised if, if this happened. I agree. I wouldn't be surprised either, but at the same time, I'm a Will Smith truther. <laughs> Number three, Will Smith finished the season with a 3.9 F4 this dude bangs yeah. 578 plate appearances 260 343 465 slash line 24 home runs 87 driven in walks a ton doesn't strike out one set 127 wrc plus and what we've been waiting on is the defensive improvements and overall last year by defensive run saved he had seven and he was about an average framer which is getting better from seasons past i really wanted to rank him like <laughs> number one because sometimes i go crazy and i fall in love with guys but he's a guy who i fall in love with too similar to sean murphy but i see a little bit more well-roundedness in sean murphy but then i just marvel at the bat of will smith something about will smith that i hear from my daughter fans because again i am from santa barbara california so my home group chat all seven of them are dodger fans all of them and then i'm the yankee fan they rave about will smith they rave that the harder it comes in, the harder it goes out. You can't get it by this man. And when, you know, Mookie, Trey, Turner, Freddie, they get all the shine, and deservedly so. But Will Smith hits fourth for a reason in the middle of these Dodger lineups, and he just barrels the baseball. Love Will Smith. I mean, he's so fun to watch it. And you mentioned the harder it go comes in, harder it goes out. You know what Will Smith hit against 95 plus mile per hour fastballs? And this is a pretty large sample size, it's a 105 plate appearance sample size of 95 plus mile per hour fastballs. Just, just what do you think his OPS was? I think it was above 800. And you, you are correct, but it was well above 800. 375, 467, 648. That's an 11, 14 <laughs> OPS against fastballs 95 and above. That like to your to your friends' point, shout out Peter Apple's group chat. 
that that's an eye test reinforced by the data. Harder it comes in, harder it goes out. This dude is a, just a pure hitter, man. He he really is. And um, you know, the defense to, to make the improvements that he has made defensively is huge because you know I think there was a point in time where like, is he going to catch? Like, is he going to still? Are they going to keep him there? And the one area that he's improved upon a lot too that I don't I think maybe might have been really frustrating for Dodgers fans was uh, limiting the run game because it used to be green light go with with John with Will Smith I mean you look at 2021 72 stolen bases against and they opponents yeah. tried 100 times and 111 starts behind the dish he was better last year 46 stolen bases on 56 attempts it's not great uh but at least they, they were running a little <laughs> bit less a little bit less it's not good it's yeah not good. but they're running less but they're running less sure um <laughs> I will say that's that's the one area where he really needs to shore that up yeah um, but he cut his errors in half um the the pass ball is cut in half uh that's the one area is is limiting the stolen bases but shit man if that's his biggest issue he improved in every other facet of catching and absolutely bangs like you said um this guy's going to be a top catcher in the game for a long time a 132 career wrc plus through his first you know three three seasons i guess you can count it's like two and a half and a half is ridiculous ridiculous and let's just marvel at the bat a little bit longer against sinkers last year hit 368 with a 653 slugging against them curveballs hit 364 against curveballs against changeups he hit 286 did struggle with the slider but literally hits everything and just goes on the field and hits and he's 27 yeah and the pop time 79th percentile it's just i think about the transfer I remember watching him. It's like, he's got a pretty slow transfer, but we'll see. I don't know. It's weird that it, it, with it's weird. decent pop time, how he just gets run on then. Like, yeah. I don't know. It's interesting. It'll improve. He's great. Love Will Smith. But a number two, maybe people think this is too high. Maybe people think he should be number one. But Adley Rutschman is number two. Put up a 5.3 at four last year. What do you have? only had 470 plate appearances. 254, 362, 445. 13 bombs, walked almost 14% of the time and struck out less than 19%, 133 WRC+, plus, put up 18 defensive runs saved, was an incredible framer. Is he a future MVP? Dude, he might be. <laughs> he really might be. Oh, I, I mean, think about what he was on pace for. Um, in terms of F4... I mean, he could have been what it would have been 113 games of 5.3 F4. Probably could have pushed towards six and a half, seven wins. As like, a catcher? Is, as a catcher. As a rookie catcher. That, that to me is absolutely remarkable. Uh, and this is a guy that was coming off of injury. Like it wasn't like he was, you know, raking in the minors and they like uh, carried the hot hand right in. He had to return from injury, get his feet kind of wet under him, uh, played a few games in the minors first, and then went to the big leagues. I I, I can't imagine what he's going to do next year in a full full season scale. Like this guy could legitimately win MVPs, and and that's kind of what the bar was set for for him, right? Like he was kind of that no brainer one one pick designed in a lab in the sense of switch hitting catcher with power and a good approach who doesn't strike out and plays great defense. Like what the hell is that? Like it's absolutely unbelievable, but I, I just am floored that the defense translated that immediately and the pat translated that immediately. Um, the Orioles are, are set at the catcher catching position for a very, very, very long time. And he's going to be their, their middle of the order masher too. I mean, man, what, that's where it's, the so nice to have the number one pick because that was the year to have it. Yeah. Adley freaking Rutschman. Anything else on him? Because I think, you know, he's 25, 26 years old. He's going to hit forever. I guess, you know, when you were doing your prospect write-ups, like what was the one thing? Because everybody had him one sure. and deservedly so. Um, And I know when you're ranking him, it was tough. You know, the Bobby Wood Jr., Julio Rodriguez, Adley Rutschman trio was impossible to rank. It was one of those ones where you throw all three names in a hat and you pick whatever order. And it's like, yeah, that's probably the right order. We have no idea. But what was it about Adley that I think that you thought shot out the most? Like, what was the most unbelievable thing? Because he does so many amazing things. But what was the one calling card where you thought, I'm amazed? 
honestly, man, like, because the bat was was always so good. I just really didn't believe how good the glove was. Like, I, I knew it was good, but I didn't believe that it was like 70 defensive grade, glo- like, you know, 70 glove good until I really broke down the video. And I'm like, holy shit. Like, this dude is is a gold glove defender. And that's when I was like, all right, it, it's a wrap. Like, with his bat, there was no questions about that. I mean, we saw this guy hit moon tanks. You remember, like, the viral TikTok, the one of him hitting with, like, a metal bat over on, like, some some old field? And we're just watching his swing. It was before he debuted, and it was like, oh, my God. Like, that swing Gorgeous. is, like, perfect. But honestly, it was the glove. I, I couldn't believe that a guy that hits that well can feel that well as a catcher. I, I It breaks my brain because we talk about all these other guys that, like, you know, it's like one thing usually gives. There was nothing that really gave. The only one thing, and I think it's still something to monitor, but it's not the end of the world, is that his right-handed swing is not as consistent as his left-handed swing. He struggled a little bit at the big league level well, from the right side. But shit, man, if that's the biggest issue, I, I, he's still going to be fine. Yeah, and he's still going to hit fine, righty. It's just he's not elite right-handed yet after one year. But I think and what we were discussing, and there was a couple of camps who said Adley should be one. But there was more camps that said J. Till Rumuto should be yeah. the number one catcher in Major League Baseball. He put up a six and a half war season. So we're talking about Adley being on pace for six and a half, maybe seven war. J. T. Real Muto of the Philadelphia Phillies did that. Yeah. 562 plate appearances, slash 276, 342, 470, just a gorgeous slash line, 22 bombs, 84 driven in. Doesn't walk a ton, but walks enough. Doesn't strike out. 128 WRC plus. A consistent savant with the glove. Best arm in Major League Baseball for my money. He has the best pop time in Major League Baseball last year. And that's been a thing that's just continually running. He has the best arm. And this is funny. Over the last five years, the all-star backup has put up 23 F4. The next best catcher, Yasmani Grandal, has just 14.7. I'm reading that directly off the article on JustBaseball.com, <laughs> where there's a ton more analysis that we're not even going to. So definitely check out this article. But then, of course, stole 21 bases last year and caught a league-leading 30 runners on base to go along with his excellent blocking. Yeah. This is the best catcher in baseball. You can think Adley will be better in future years. You can even think he might be better next year. But what are we going to do? We know that JT's the man. There's no. It wasn't a JT at a down year last year where it's like, okay, maybe now he can overtake him. After the year JT put up, Adley, I think, could have done anything, and we wouldn't have ranked him above JT. He would have had to legitimately have the one six, like played the 162 and had a seven something F war because. Guess what, dude? JT had a six five. Yeah, and and let let his team to the to the World Series. I mean, it wasn't alone, but he was a, he was the catcher on a team that made the World Series, um, and and played a huge part in that. Uh, from from the way that he defends to the way that he hits, and then he went twenty twenty for the first time since what Pudge as a catcher. <laughs> like this is ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. And and the fact that he had his best season at age thirty one is is remarkable. Um, he's gonna be thirty two in less than a month. And, and a specific thing that that really stands out with me about, you know, and you wonder why he's so athletic. And, and also you mentioned the arm. You know, he was a quarterback in high school and a shortstop. Marlins drafted him, signed him for 600K, and then moved him to catcher. <laughs> and it took some time. Um, and, and he just developed, developed, developed. The bat wasn't great right out of the gate, and it got better and better and better. And then, of course, the Marlins traded him for Sixto Sanchez and Jorge Alfaro. But, you know, that's besides the point. Um <laughs> Like this is a guy that just seems to keep getting better before our eyes. Like it, it, that's the amazing part. And I think he's going to age pretty well. Will, will he be as fast? Maybe not, but like right now he still moves um, and he hits the ball hard. And I mean, I, I'm just such a big fan of the way this guy plays watching him come up uh, was awesome. I think this is going to go down of all the trades that the Marlins made, you know, through that little era there of, of, you know, the Jeter era. Um, I think this is the worst one. I really do. And I, I know you could say, yeah, what you could say this or that you could say that. I think this is the worst one because this guy was arguably the best catcher in baseball then. And he's arguably not really arguably the best catcher in baseball now until Adley Rutschman dethrones him. You know how hard it is to be a top one or two catcher for eight years across two different teams. Like that's insane. And, and that's the thing is you look at from 2017 onward, 4.4 F4, 4.8 F4, 5.6 F4. 
abbreviated 2020 season, he had a 1.6 F4. Then 2021, a 4.5 F4. Then last year, 6.5. He's legitimately a minimum 4.4 F4 guy every year since 2017. That's the best catcher in baseball. Best catcher in baseball. This shows his well-roundedness. Last year, he led National League catchers in batting average, slugging, stolen bases, defensive run saved, and pop time. So every level, bat to ball, power, speed, framing, throwing guys out, overall ability, he was the best. So he has to be the best catcher in baseball. Just to go over our top 10 again, number 10, we have Jonah Heim of the Texas Rangers. Number nine, Jose Trevino of the New York Yankees. Number eight, Tyler Stevenson of the Cincinnati Reds. Number seven, Cal Raleigh of the Seattle Mariners. Number six, Alejandro Kirk of the Toronto Blue Jays. Number five, Wilson Contreras, new St. Louis Cardinal. Number four, Sean Murphy, new Atlanta Brave. Number three, Will Smith of the Los Angeles Dodgers. Number two, Adley Rutschman, Baltimore Orioles. And number one, JT Real Muto with honorable mentions, William Contreras on the Brewers, Danny Jansen on the Toronto Blue Jays, and Gabriel Moreno, the new Arizona Diamondback. What a list. Great what job, us. Position's getting good, man. And what's crazy is you'll see when the top 100 prospect list comes out in, in, in a week or two, probably a little bit more than that, probably a couple weeks. But so many catchers. Like, it went from just barren position to, like, we're seeing a lot more catchers and a lot more athletic catchers, as you can see. So I think Rio Muto kind of set set the tone there um, and has really uh, changed the position a little bit. Mind you, Adley Rutschman was a kicker. Like they, this, there's a, some of the best catchers are athletic guys. So I think that's kind of what we're seeing. Uh, you also have an Alejandro Kirk, but like he's, I think he has to be sneaky athletic to to, to carry around that 300, 280 pounds, whatever he is. Um, like he's got it. He's got to be. What? <laughs> what is he? Three hundred pounds at five eight. No, I think he's two sixty. I think. I don't buy uh, it. Two seventy five. <laughs> Uh, but like you, you gotta be like elastic and move around but um yeah man i don't envy these guys i took a foul tip to the cup when i was like 12 yep was like get me out get me out i kept looking at my dad and he's like finish the inning and i'm like crying back there as each pitch comes in and i never did it again and you know now you have balls coming at you in 98 you got five guys foul tipping it. You got dudes on the backswing drilling you in the back of the head. Like these guys are not only some of the most talented with all of the skills required, they're badass, dude. Like that shit's scary. I would like that. I would kill to be a major leaguer, but if you told me you're a catcher, I'm like, eh, I'm like, just would, stick to the podcasting thing. I would love to talk to Will Smith, especially, and ask him about his Frey metrics. He's like, you tried Frey, Bruzar, Gratterall, followed yeah. by Blake Trident, followed by Alex Vessia, and then sometimes Dustin May, followed by Clayton Kershaw. Just completely different pitchers, inning in, inning out. And then sometimes these guys, especially because the Dodgers, they go five innings, and then they have, of course, all the bullpen guys from all these different angles in order to get guys out. He's like, it's impossible to frame. <laughs> like what I'm seeing, that's my- a 92 mile an hour lefty two seamer versus a 90. 99 mile hour righty sinker. It's got to be an impossible task. That's my favorite part is like, you got assholes like us sitting here being like, frame better. And yeah. it's like, you got like dudes wielding a wood stick, like in a, like while this little object is flying at you 100 miles an hour. And we're like, bro, like you're supposed to catch it and make it look like it's over here. Like, yeah. are you serious? So, you know, I, I, I want to just say, like, as we like critique every little thing that these guys do, they're all so freaking good. Even fucking Jorge Alfaro out there. Like, that guy's nasty to freak. agree. Yeah, freak. freak. Um, but no, I, 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 catching positions are fun to rank. I'm glad we were able to do it. And uh, what do we got left? We got a few more positions left, right? We got a lot to look forward to. Third base, first base, pitchers, outfield, corner outfield, relievers, bullpens, starting rotations. So much more is happening here on the Just Baseball Show and on JustBaseball.com. What I'm most excited about what's happening on just baseball.com besides all these top tens is the world baseball classic previews. We are pumping them out like nobody's business. Every team is getting a full preview as well as I will be releasing my world baseball classic betting preview on not gambling advice, but then also we're doing world baseball classic previews on this show. We're also going to be in Florida to go over and to 
you know, just cover the World Baseball Classic yeah. in Florida while doing a Culver's review, which might end up being more impactful for our listeners. It might. Uh, it sounds like it. I think if we said, like, Team Israel is going to run the table, people would be like, oh, nice. Sounds Culver good. sucks. Like, oh, <laughs> fuck you. Like, <laughs> you know, what do you mean? Like, that's a hot take. Like, all right. So um, we're, that's we're willing to take don't, it. Though. Don't sleep on Team Israel. Don't sleep on Team Israel. I'm going to probably be putting something together soon, too, of top prospects to follow in the Ooh, World Baseball Classic. Love that. Um, give you a little guide if you're not a huge prospector. It's just kind of fun. You know, you have a random game on. Kind of know what what to look out for, like Harry Ford for Great Britain, for example. Like, there's a lot of prospects, Owen Casey for Canada, that are going to get an opportunity that they wouldn't otherwise have for a long time. Like, we might see a Harry Ford against a Sandy, or we might see like you know an Owen Casey against you know somebody else of of note. Like, that's very cool, um, and that's what what's cool about the World Baseball Classic. So, looking forward to our increased coverage of that, and the Just Baseball Show will be breaking that down plenty. Absolutely. And of course, all the new podcasts on the network, definitely go check them out. Uh, there's a list in our link tree on social. If you want to see them all out, who's better baseball, just fantasy baseball show, which is doing really well right now. All the fantasy baseball stuff, people are getting ready for the season. Our guy Colby and Claire are handling that. But again, want to make sure everyone gets the app prize picks. It's in the episode description, 100% deposit match. If you use code, just baseball, because we will have season long props on there. I already just came out by the time you're listening to this. If you check on my Twitter, you will, all, or the TikTok or the Instagram, you will find my favorite season long props, whether it's strikeouts and home runs. I want to get those out before I think the lines move because I think the lines are broken. One line that I'm so upset that I didn't grab and I knew I should have, but I was just doing so much research. Then, then the line moved. Pete Alonso open at 28 and a half home runs. Guess what it is now? What is it now? 38 and a half. I missed it. Was it like a glitch? Broken line. That's what I believe these two are. Not that level, but just every projection system, everything they've done in the past, everything is much better than the line says. So unless they get hurt, that's the only reason I think that that line will go under. Make sure you do that. And you can play them for free on price picks. Guess what? Price picks also is a free Lucas square that you can pair with it. He only has to have one 30 point game in the second half. Do you think he's going to do that? Um, yeah, I think I might do that game one. So yeah. yeah, and you can pair that with these two in order to get the best value ever. And it helps Make, us. And it helps us. Make sure to download prize picks. That's in the episode description. And with that, thank you, everybody. <laughs>